I have the honor now of introducing you to a great friend of mine. I was thinking back when, 27 years ago, I started working at this church, and I got to work next to Miss Lori Hancock. And I've got to be more than just a, a work, workaholic with you <laughs> some days, but I, we got to be great friends. And we worked together, and then we became friends, and then we got to work together again and stay friends. So, Miss Lori, bless you as you bless the congregation. Thank you, Father. Now for the juggling act. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do want to say Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here and all those watching online. I hope that what we share with you today will be a blessing. I'd like to start by reading Deuteronomy 9, I'm sorry, 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. I've been part of this church family since I was six years old. It's kind of a long time. I did leave for a bit in my early 20s, actually most of my 20s, but I came back. I met my husband, George, and I married him here in this church. It's been 33 years that I've been married to him. Uh, we raised our children in this church. Thank you. We have two boys, Jared and Clint. Jared is married to Samantha, and they have blessed us with our first grandchild, Laurel Page. Thank you. And our youngest is our daughter, Rebecca, and she lives in Farmingdale, New York. Hi, Becca. She's watching online. I started working at Pine Castle shortly after I got married, and I did work in the children's department for almost 10 years with Sandra. I left, became a preschool teacher, and then I came back as the director of On the Rock Preschool. That was my favorite job. I retired about six years ago, and I currently facilitate the Pine Castle Family Night Ladies Group that meets in the parlor on Wednesday nights. Great group of ladies, we mentor each other, and we study the Word of God. This church is a very big part of who I am. I'd like to ask you a question this morning. Do you live for God or from God? And let me explain what I think the difference is. You see, I know it's hard to be a good mom. Like I said, I had three children. They were each one different, and they needed different things from me as their mom. I also had two miscarriages, and processing that loss was extremely difficult. So when I added to that mix, trying to live for God, using my own strength to accomplish what I thought he required of me, most of the time I was worn out, and I was constantly defeated. There is a mother in the Bible that I relate to. She tried to do things in her own power and failed. Do you remember Hagar? She was Sarah's slave, and she had Abraham's first child, and that caused problems between her and Sarah, especially after Sarah had Isaac, so much so that Sarah asked Abraham to send her and her son away. Let me read from Genesis 21, 14 through 19. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God, you see, God always comes through for us, doesn't he? Genesis 21, 19 says, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. You see, God saw her. She was worn out and she was defeated, like me. But God saw her. He heard the cry of her son. He provided water, and she gave that water to her son. Thank you. So God provided water for Hagar. And Hagar gave her son life-giving water. 
Hagar's name in Hebrew means flight. I know that I wanted to run from my mother responsibilities, not physically, but mentally. But when I started living from God, things began to change. I realized God had already filled me each day, whatever each day held. I didn't have to fret over how I compared to other women, other moms. And the more my faith increased in God, the more my trust increased in God. So how did this happen? Well, first, let me say, I am still a work in progress, and it did not happen overnight. This change started when I got to know the women in this church, the moms, the grandmas, and the prayer warriors in my church family. When you surround yourself with real people who will share their good and bad experiences and share with you how God has come through for them, you can learn from their example how to live from God. When you live from God and the love that he pours into you daily, you don't have to compare yourself with other women. And your trust in God increases. When I live from God, I have more to give, I feel loved, and I depend on God to handle what I don't know how to handle. Living for God was too hard because it was all about me. And living from God, it's all about him. You see, it didn't change my circumstances. It just changed my focus. And that brings me to the first point in your bulletin. When you live from God, you don't compare yourself to others. Galatians 6, 4, and 5 says, Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. You see, our loads are different, so there's no way we can look like somebody else. I have some friends with me today who are going to share with you, and I know you'll be blessed by them. First, there's Brooke Lambert. She's the mother of two beautiful girls, Maggie and Mary Jo, and she's going to share on the dangers of comparison. Thank you, Lori. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. In Exodus 1 through 2, you will find the story of an expectant mother who had unshakable faith and who found freedom in her surrender to God's plan for her family. During a time of Egyptian tyranny, where the Pharaoh ordered every Hebrew baby boy to be killed in order to suppress a Hebrew uprising, this mother prayed that her baby would be a boy. When she gave birth to him, she thanked and praised God for her son. This mother silenced her fear, listened to God's voice, and hid her son for three months. Then, when her son grew older, she had no other choice but to put her baby's life into God's hand. She placed her baby into a carefully made basket and gently pushed him down the river. As Moses floated along the Nile River, his older sister, Miriam, followed along the bank and watched what would happen to him. The basket floated right into the Pharaoh's palace lagoon, where the princess was bathing. She inspected the basket and to her surprise, there was a baby inside, and she knew that this was a Hebrew baby. Miriam, standing close by, called to the princess, asking her if she needed help. The princess asked Miriam to find a Hebrew mother to nurture and nurse the baby until he came of age. Of course, Miriam, so excited, ran to her mother and told her the good news, that she would be able to be with Moses again. What a gift. This is the beginning of Moses' story, but it just may be the most monumental act of faith and surrender any mother has, any, has ever had to carry out. This is the story of Jochebed, Moses' mother. In Hebrew, Jochebed means to bring God's glory, and that is just what she did. It was because of Jochebed's faith and surrender to God that Moses was able to grow up in royalty, being exposed to arithmetic, agriculture, and leadership. He was educated, well-fed, yet he was rooted in the seeds that Jochebed had planted when he was a child. And as a result, God's plan was made perfect. God used Moses as the very instrument that delivered the Israelites from Egypt. Can you imagine the struggle and the heart-wrenching pain that Jochebed must have felt 
as she surrendered her child. All the planning that went into the hiding, the basket, the location on the river, this all took incredible faith. Jochebed had no idea, no idea what would transpire when she placed her son into the Nile. But nevertheless, she put her faith in God and she surrendered to his plan without fear. When Lori asked me to speak today, I, imme I immediately thought, why me? Um, I'm not qualified to stand here and, and speak to the church. Certainly there's somebody else um, that's a stronger speaker, a better believer to deliver this message. And isn't that just the way that comparison ruins God's opportunities for us? These thoughts are hurtful, and they're not from God. Comparison, by definition, is the act of examining things to see the similarities and the differences. When it comes to God's plan for us, he has already examined. It is only our job to seek him and his will for us. As a young mother in today's society, today's world, it certainly is a challenge to curb comparison. The pervasiveness of social media, it drowns us every day in comparison. I can also imagine that Jacobed felt pressure to succumb to the government's tyranny, but she stood up to her fear. She accepted her lot, and she surrendered to God's plan. Thank you, Lord, that I do not have to face the decision to surrender my children to push them down a river. However, God's message still remains the same, and the principles and insights from Jacobed's story absolutely apply to many of the struggles that we face today. Comparison steals our joy and shifts our focus away from the blessings that God has gifted to us. When we compare, we cannot hear God's voice, his calling, and in turn, we cannot surrender to his perfect plan for our lives. Amen. Thank you, Brooke. And that brings us to the second point. When you live from God, you trust God more. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. This is my friend Marnie Stolenwort, and she is the mother of two wonderful young ladies, Annie and Maddie, and she's going to share about trust. Thank you. Um, as Lori said, my name is Marnie Stolenwort. I have two daughters. Anne is 19, and she's a sophomore at the University of South Florida, and our youngest daughter is Maddie. She's 16 now, and she's officially a senior in high school. And Jay and I have been married for 23 years. 21 of those have been active membership in this church. Our girls were raised in the church. Uh, they started out in the nursery, and then parents stay out, which turned into On the Rock. And it was in our children's ministry that they accepted the Lord as their Savior. And they have continued to walk with him and as a great encouragement for any mother. When Lori asked me to speak today, I knew trust was the topic that um, God would want me to share with you. Because just as they have shared, um, trust has been a process for me. To truly trust God, especially with my children, has not been easy. Um, it all started on September 11th, 2001, when the Twin Towers crashed into the World Trade Center. I was five months pregnant. And I was just on my way to work. It was my mom's birthday. She was in my thoughts. And that tragedy happened. And it changed my life. I remember thinking, I cannot believe we're bringing a child into this world. I was, I was really shaken by it. But my dad told me words that I still say to myself. And I say it to others. He said, Marnie, you can trust God with this or you can't. You will believe what he says or you won't. But whatever you decide will set the course of your life so my journey um, in living from God really started in September of 2001. The woman in the Bible who I turn to often as an example, not only of motherhood and raising a child, but her unrelenting and unwavering faith is Mary, the mother of Jesus. We read about her in the Gospels. But her story starts with a dramatic shift in her world, right? An angel shows up, sent by God, and tells her, you're going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a son, and I want you to name him Jesus or Rescuer. And I think in an instant, everything changed. 
But faithfully, God also followed that with a promise. And the promise was, your son will be great. He will be the Messiah. He will sit on the throne of David, and his kingdom will never end. I think Mary was much quicker than me to choose trust because the Bible says she pondered those things and basically said, okay, let it be so. But I also know in reading her story that she was a a very real human mom with real struggles and real issues. And um, we know that she trusted God when she was an unwed pregnant teenager. When she had a little boy, less than two, a little toddler, and a king was trying to kill him. They were being hunted. That is terrifying. And then when he was 12 and he got lost, in her mind, on the way home from the temple, and who hasn't lost their, well, I've lost my child at Disney World a couple of times, and um, maybe them all once, but, you know, she shared those fears. They were real. And I think in those moments, she had to cling to that promise. All of those things that God promised, if they're true and I trust them, I'm okay. So she did set an example for me to follow. Um, She raised her son in the truth of his identity, told him the promise that God had for his life, and raised him in faith. She knew her son the same way that we know our children. She saw his character. She watched him grow up. She saw him become a young man. She saw him make his own decision to follow the Lord and obey God's call. And she was a constant support in his ministry and his purpose. We always see her in the background when we read the stories of Christ. I think in her humanity, she probably whispered that promise back to God in a spirit of thanksgiving when she saw Jesus rise in popularity and the world loved him and they worshiped him as he came into the city. And she may have shouted that promise back to God as a reminder through tears of anguish when she stood at the cross at his feet. Scripture tells us that Mary never never gave up her faith and her trust because we know that after Jesus ascended, she was in an upper room praying with other believers. She never wavered in that. But I think for her, faith and trust especially was a process. She had to repeatedly trust that promise for God, promise from God. Um, At 9-11, I think my prayer was, help me trust you, Lord. Just help me trust you. And after raising our girls, um, you know, they're not gone yet, but we've seen some trials. We have seen accusations. We have gone through some, some difficult things. And I think now that watching Mary, watching the women in this church, um, keeping them in the Lord and reminding them of who they are and what God's promise is for them, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he does sit on the throne of David, and he will have a kingdom. He has a kingdom that will never end. That has helped me now say, when things come at me, I mean, I know when things come at you, I can say, God, I trust you with this, and I'm a lot quicker to do it now than I was then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ladies. That brings us to the third point. Surround yourself with family and keep your focus on God. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. That's Galatians 6.10. I would like to introduce Lisa Newsom, her daughter, Karen Hawkins, and Karen's daughter, Lisa's granddaughter, Cheyenne. They are going to share about family and leaving a legacy and the story of Lois and Eunice, who were Timothy's mother and grandmother. Good morning. I'm reading from 2 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with the clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have, been, have become convinced of, 
because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All right. <laughs> what do you think of when you hear hand-me-downs? I think of when I was a teenager, I would get my sister's old clothes that didn't fit her anymore. Totally last year's fashion. Or my mother's ice chest that she got from her grandmother. But the most important hand-me-downs come in very different form. They are values, beliefs, habits, morals that we pass along from one person to the next. More often, they are passed from parent or grandparent to a younger family member. We, always, we are always passing things around. Attitudes, habits, and values are constantly being taught. Through the process, we leave a legacy to those who have known us. The same is true of our faith. We have perceived God, Jesus, the church, and God's plan for our life is definitely shaped how we experience faith as a child. We can't undo our childhood experience, although we can and should replace any false, harmful views with the truth, as we can be very intentional about what we are passing on to those around us especially this important area of faith. Some of my earliest childhood memories of church as going, was going to Sunday school class and learning the song, This Little Light of Mine. And then as a teenager going to Wednesday night youth and gathering and getting baptized in Lake Conway after a very long day of water skiing. My parents modeled by tithing every Sunday while we attended church and praying every night before we ate dinner together. As I reflect on my heritage of faith, it reminds me of the story of Eunice and Lois, Timothy's mother and grandmother. These women were intentional in passing. These women were intentional in passing along Timothy in a rich heritage of faith. They knew the importance of teaching young Timothy the Holy Spirit, which they did from his infancy. Whether we realize it or not, we are constantly influencing others. Let's live with purpose in intentionally choosing language, habits, and attitudes, and actions that reflect those of Christ. This is something my mother passed down to me, and something I am purposely passing down to my daughter. Cheyenne has a letter she would like to read, thanking God for the legacy of the faith handed down to her. Dear God, thank you for my grandmother. I am thankful that she goes to church with me, donates things to those in need, and being there for those who need her. Thank you for my mother. I love her because she shares her love with me by taking me to church, signing me up for PC summer camps, and watching Veggie Tales with me when I was younger. <laughs> I love you, God, and I hope you allow me to share your love with those around me like my mother and grandmother have done for me. Amen. When I was a preschool teacher, parents used to ask my advice on decisions that they had to make for their children. And no matter what I said to them, I always ended by saying, you can't make a mistake that God can't turn to good. You see, we know that all things, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Motherhood is a great purpose. My mom was a good mom. She loved me and I knew that. But my mom wasn't perfect and neither am I. <laughs> As a mom, I try to do what's right. I try to love my children unconditionally and treat them fairly. I tried to teach them about Jesus so they too could have a personal relationship with him. And you know, I feel like I was a good mom except 
when I wasn't. <laughs> when they were little, I remember yelling a lot. I demanded too much of them, and sometimes my punishment didn't fit their crime. It usually just fit my attitude at the time. There are other things that I'm not going to mention. That's enough. <laughs> my sister-in-law, Teresa, is a prayer minister at the Inheritance House, and she prays with many people whose lives have been negatively affected by imperfect mothers. Sometimes it takes years for the hurt, for hurt children to let go of that unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is a big rock to carry. It causes bitterness, anger, anxieties, fears, and insecurities. That doesn't leave much room for God's love, does it? I know that there are some wrongs that will never be made right. And I know that there are some that have cut so deep they will forever leave a scar on your heart. But forgiveness takes away the bitterness, the anger, the anxieties, the fears, the insecurities. God wants to replace the ugly with beautiful. He wants to turn the mistakes of your past into good. Good for you, good for your family, good for your children, good for all of those that you pour into each day. In order to forgive, you need only to be sure the wrong done to you does not take up residence in your heart. Forgiveness heals a wounded heart. And that brings us to point number four. Forgiveness takes the rocks that block the flow of God's love to you and to others. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God has forgiven you. Moms, maybe you need to forgive yourself for things you did or didn't do. I know I did. It's hard to be a good mom, but God, uh, our good God can take our mistakes and turn them to good for our children. We each have different stories, as you've heard this morning, but we are all loved by God. God determined our worth a long time ago before he created us in our mother's womb. By the blood and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, he made his intentions clear. We are chosen, we are forgiven, and we are not forgotten. And he wants to bless us from generation to generation to generation. You know, you don't have to be a mother to reap the benefits of family. <laughs> We're a church family, and I'm glad you're part of this family with me. We're going to end this morning with the blessing song. It's straight from the Bible, and it's for each one of us. So receive this blessing from God. Thank you.
An incredible gift was given to us today, and I so enjoyed it. And I want to thank you guys are amazing. Are you free next Sunday to do this again? And this is, can you guys stand up? Will you put your hands together and thank every single person? Amazing. Thank you. They even gave you the definition of people's names. Wasn't that amazing? I am so proud of you guys. You guys listen. <laughs> On behalf of, uh, of our family, uh, we want to wish you a very, very happy uh, Mother's Day. This was a, a gift for all the moms, and I'm so very proud of uh, all the women who are involved today and uh, as their gift to you uh, to make this day very, very special. Would you stand up across the auditorium? We're going to... We're going to dismiss. We're going to give you five extra minute gentlemen to go by Publix and get flowers, make reservations for a restaurant, go by and pick up some steaks. You got some few extra minutes to go do that. But uh, God bless all of you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for an incredible, meaningful service that um, gives us hope 
for the heroes that have gone before us that, uh, Father, we can follow in their legacy and we can pass it from one generation to the next. Lord, I bless the mothers that are here today, the grandmothers that are here today. Lord, I bless the mothers-to-be, God, that they will have your blessing upon them to be all that you created them to be. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. We'll see you next week.